I'm flying into Kandahar, the single biggest coalition base in southern Afghanistan, from where Australian SAS and troops from the US, Canada and NATO are in the middle of fighting the strongest Taliban offensive since 2001. Next month, NATO will be assuming command of operations here, and it will be this man, Britain's Lieutenant General David Richards, in charge. You never know your luck. <laughs> There's no doubt that the Taliban are uh, in greater strength and a little bit more organised than hitherto, but we're on the case. While the streets of Kandahar are bustling with activity, foreigners here travel in armoured vehicles as suicide attacks, bombings and shootings inside the city are now common. Just last Sunday, a suicide bomber in this car tried to kill the governor of Kandahar in the centre of the city. The blast killed four civilians and wounded 12. The governor narrowly escaped. It's here where the Taliban came from, and it is here that they are fighting back. It's only a 10 minute drive to the posts in the suburbs, which are the front line in this war. Here the Taliban are strong enough to attack the police in posts like this one. The post commander, Ramatullah, says they are barely equipped for their frontline role. Does he have enough weapons to uh, defend his post in this area properly? For example, that weapon behind you is um, held together with sticky tape. Is the quality of your weapons uh, a problem here? Yeah. Out to the west of Kandahar city, the fighting has been constant. The day we head out towards Panjwai, the Afghan army posts are abandoned. Disturbingly, the police and the civilian population are nowhere to be seen. Three days later, this was the scene of a full-scale battle. The coalition called in airstrikes, killing as many as 80 Taliban and civilians. <laughs> Afghan President Hamid Karzai protested about the casualties. It is incidents like these that are turning the people against the foreign forces and back to the Taliban. Dr Sharifa Siddiqui is the director of the Kandahar Hospital, where there are now daily incidents of civilian deaths, mostly shot by the coalition. Are the families very angry? Um, what, what's the reaction by the people here? Uh, the Fearing for my safety because I was a foreigner, hospital authorities didn't allow me to see the wounded. This handover to Lieutenant General Richards 
marks the next stage in NATO's expansion in Afghanistan. His command is set to have 21,000 soldiers here by the end of the year. 8,000 of those will take over the security in the south, including 540 Australians. With the Canadian deployment down there, they've already had quite a few casualties. Do you expect the British contingents, the Australian contingents, the Dutch contingents to all have, I suppose, the same kind of um, baptism of fire, more or less? Well, I think inevitably there will be a baptism of fire. Um, I'm absolutely confident, though, that the robust stance taken by the Canadians will be emulated by all the other nations going into the South. I mean, this is a big thing for NATO. And, and as the Secretary General of NATO, many others have said, we cannot afford to fail. Uh, and, and all our soldiers are, are very clear on that. At the same stage, we can't afford to take lots of casualties. So there's a balance to be struck. This mission, your previous experience in East Timor, of course, and also in Sierra Leone, um, how does this mission compare? I mean, it must be the toughest one you've ever Yeah, just a little. Yeah. Uh, these were good training missions, really. Um, learned an immense amount from them. Um, I think in many ways East Timor was a model of what we need to do better at here, and that's close military-civilian cooperation. But if we don't get that very close coordination right, then a military alone in a counterinsurgency like this will never win. The reality for these farmers who live on the western outskirts of Kandahar shows some of the problems of fighting a war amidst a population you are trying to win over. They tell me how the Afghan police responded after a recent attack. <laughs> Abdul Qadar Norzai is the local representative of the Afghan Independent Commission of Human Rights. He says the coalition operations in the south are alienating the population. Belgade, <laughs> Two years ago, Dateline filmed these pictures of US Marines conducting operations in Uruzgan province. The legacy of hate generated by these US operations will be inherited by Australian troops in Uruzgan. There is a lot of bitterness within the community about the way the Americans have conducted operations, um, such as house searches, arrests, um, what are seen as arbitrary arrests. How will you overcome that resentment? It's a very important point and one we're aware of. First of all, you learn lessons from all these things. The US uh, commanders here have le are learning the same lessons about how to approach it. The need to be clinically precise. If you have, if you know there's someone in the house, okay, you might need to go in there, but don't otherwise. You know, actually it's better in terms of, a, of winning a campaign to forgo potential opportunities rather than go in because there just might be someone in there. It's breeding a culture that sees the big picture and the long term a little bit more. Do you think the situation in the in the south of Afghanistan now is is worse than it's been since uh, 2001 when the Taliban fell? <laughs> He says his human rights investigators cannot visit the three worst affected provinces, including Uruzgon. 
او دغه منطقي حالاتو نسبت او سابق ته شنه دي موږ ډیر زیات احتیاط کو حتا موږ خپل په کارو کې ډیر زیات کنټرول او ته کارو چې په خو موږ کولې موږ په منطقه کې وس خپل کارمندان زنه لیږم There is no safe way to travel from Kandahar to Tarankot where the Australians are based. This is why no Australian journalists have been here since the deployment was announced. The Australian forces do not allow media to travel with them. If you go alone, you can be hauled out of your car at a Taliban checkpoint and, as has happened on this road, be beheaded on the spot. No foreigners, unless they are in armoured vehicles, ever travel this road now. It has the highest security rating of any in the country. If you go in a convoy like this one, they regularly get attacked. This convoy of 20 fuel tankers is guarded by just two ute loads of police. They've got RPGs, AKs and heavy machine guns, but so have the Taliban. Commander Mohammed Issa was in charge of the escort on this convoy. The report halat khlo da halat sti da wo sale halat halat ne chok na bazar ko ja na chat mal mish. Da da chawalat ra rwa ni chi yo ra jo zai khatar bal ra jo ga zai ni bal zai khatar bal ra jo ga zai ni bal zai da walat ra rwa ni dis khas da da sali sar na. The week before a similar convoy of tankers was attacked near here and four of the police escort were killed. This is the heavily fortified home to the Australian Special Forces and the advanced elements of the engineers in Tarrancot. This base is regularly attacked and the only real area that can be said to be under government control. The main street is the only place in town where you don't run the risk of being stopped by the Taliban. Although they watch it and there are regular suicide attacks here. Tarankot is the capital of Erzgan province. The Taliban control three of the districts in Erzgan and a fourth district, Chora, fell to the Taliban last week. An airborne coalition assault reportedly retook the area over the weekend, killing 12 Taliban. This is how the coalition troops are forced to move inside the town of Tarankot, which they say they control. These American troops, accompanied by an Australian officer, are simply making a routine visit to the local recruiting office of the Afghan National Army. As you can see, even in town, they take no chances. The Australian officer is following orders and will not talk to the media at all even though I identify myself as an Australian. The US commander and the governor are visiting the hospital when we arrive. They both have their own security. There is more security inside the hospital. There's uh, Taliban forces near in Marabat and near uh, Hurma. About uh, two kilometers of this city, you cannot go. Okay, okay. Two kilometers. Yeah. All of the village, there is no security, there is no government. Yeah. The hospital is guarded by men with AK-47s and heavy machine guns. As the only functioning government institution in Tarankot, it's a prime target. لکه د ولسوالو ته تګور اتک چې د مرکز د مریضان مشکلات راځي نسی کول چې اجرای کی صحیح پرسونل یا ډاکټران زړه نسی نیول چې ولسوالو ته ولاړ شي کو ولاړ شي غل داسې یو برخلیک سره مخ کیږي چې هغه ډیر بده خاطره ورته پیدا کیږي یعنی یو ډاکټر چې پر مثال دوی شکل تحصیل کړی هغه ولاړ شي د ولسوالو کې د یو چا د لاس په حساب ضرر وویني اختار ورکول کیږي بل کیږي بل دا ټول مشکلات د امنیتي وزې پرې اړه لري for these besieged government workers, one of the main problems is nobody outside knows just how bad the situation is. Uh, 
که هغه د مخالف قدرتونو د خواسی او که د حکومت د خواسی نه د دې باید په په جهانی توګه په میډیا او کې باید نشرات نشر سی The local police commander in Tarankot shows me the vehicles that have been blown out from under him. Commander Razi Khan has been police chief in Tarankot since 2001. The area he controls has now shrunk to a 10 kilometre circle around the town as the Taliban have gained strength in Uruzgon. How long has Tarankot basically been cut off from the rest of the province? Why do you think it's got stronger in the last three to four months? Why do you think they're so close? He tells me that the Australian troops already here are actively engaged in major operations against the Taliban. This one only 30 kilometres away on May 5. The operation failed in its objective. The Taliban simply returned to the area after the Australians left. How many people did the Australians kill? The last four months have been the worst since the Taliban fell. Brigadier Shah Mahmood, from the Defence Ministry in Tarankot, described another Australian operation. Do you know if anybody was killed or injured? The operations conducted by the Australians already in Oruzgon have been shrouded in secrecy by the Australian Defence Department. They don't want to admit that our troops are fighting the Taliban and killing people they believe to be the enemy. None of this is reported, and these Australian officers who interrupted my interview with Uruzgan's governor refused to talk and instructed him not to. Despite their reluctance to talk to the media, it is clear the security situation for the Australian troops in Tarankot is dire, and, if anything, getting worse. The next contingent of 240 Australian troops are engineers, due at the end of next month. They are supposed to be carrying out reconstruction. Given the war zone they are entering in Oruzgon, it's unlikely they will be building anything. 
they'll be fully occupied defending themselves against the Taliban. Casualties are a certainty in this deployment. John Martinkus going where few are prepared to go in southern Afghanistan.